Alex, welcome. Thank you for having me, sir. It's a pleasure. Oh, absolutely. So in my hands, I am holding a book by the name Through My Sight, The Story of a Survivor. Yes. And it's an autobiographical book that you wrote. Uh, please tell us a little bit about it. Well, Through My Sight is um, written as uh, to serve its purpose as an inspiration to other people who are struggling and going through different phases of their lives. Difficult phases for the most part, but um, it basically focuses on every little um, aspect that young people are going through, as well as older people, because um, at some point in life, I believe that everybody goes through a very tough time, and sometimes they just need some some positivity, something to look after, and something to look forward to. So that's why I just thought that it would be an incredible idea for me to write something that completely has pure experiences, pure struggles, and something that everybody can relate to truthfully. You're only 22. And uh, when I read the book, I felt like it was written by somebody that is much older and has uh, much more experience. And in fact, you have so much experience for the 22 years um, that you've been around that I was just blown away. Um, now, obviously you say the story of a survivor. Um, what do you mean by that? Well, when you talk about the experience, I believe that um, it just comes from, the experience literally comes from your life experiences and your life the way you are brought brought to life i personally have been through a lot um all of different types of um struggles uh, which include family conflicts which include um life-threatening diseases which include a very risky factor um where life is never um certain life is never given the way it was supposed to and it's it that's the only reason why um even 22 years add up to a, a immense amount of experience as the the story of the survivor goes i um the reason why i wrote that is because um uh, you know um i have survived a lot of um different struggles and that's why I wrote the story of a survivor because this story is still going and hopefully this story will have a great end for everybody to follow. Um, you were born in the United States, but at a very early age, um, you went to a different country. You went to the country of Pakistan where your parents are originally from. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? And um, obviously, as a as a person that was taken out of their uh, environment and placed in a totally different environment, such as Pakistan, um, it had to be very difficult uh, in the very beginning to assimilate the new culture, and uh, you probably had a cultural shock. Yeah. Um, so I was born over here um, in Chicago. And um, I was born in a kind of a, um, a packy background family where um, there were certain things that we need to follow and certain ideals were set down to, into our minds. They were embedded and there was not a lot of space for openness. There was not a lot of space for growth over there. Um, there were certain things that we, that we were told and the biggest thing that I, I could say confidently was the gender roles. Um, being a man, I was supposed to behave in a certain way, in a more muscular way, in a more um, manly way. So that means, you know, you're, you're not supposed to cry, you're not supposed to behave in a certain way, you, you can't you can't show your feelings because you're a man, you're supposed to be stronger, all that stuff. So um, we were kind of bought into that um, into that environment uh, since the day I was born. And I can remember my father whispering into my ears those very um, masculine words, but um, that's how I was raised. Other than that, um, yes, we, we did go, I was, I went, I followed my parents and they took me to Pakistan. 
Um, I was eight years old at that time, and um, my father had some issues in these co- in this country, so he just wanted to take a fresh start. So we followed um, after him, and uh, we ended up in Pakistan that way. Now, you have five more brothers and sisters, uh, or should I say four brothers and one sister. Uh, so um, are you the youngest in the family? I am not. I have um, one younger um, brother, uh, but yeah, I, I am the fifth child. And um, yeah, we did belong to a bigger family. So. And how old were you when you went back to Pakistan? I was eight. Um, years old. I was eight years old and I didn't have a lot of say, but um, yeah, that I was eight. And you time. all decided to go back? Yes. Um, you know, Again, this is culture. If the man makes a decision, the woman must follow, okay? And the kids are just gonna follow the lead. Uh, that's, you know, we, we come from that culture where um, our choice doesn't matter, okay? Really, I'm just being honest with you at this point. So what is the very first distinct memory that you have about Pakistan? Do you remember when you landed or, or well, the house that you were in? What exactly do you remember? Well, I, I, I surprisingly have a very good memory after all that I've been through. And I remember every little bit. Um, I remember when we were landing from Pakistan International Airways, PIA. Um, I had some very weird visuals, you can call it, where um, I would see pieces of glass getting broken and it was just something that didn't make sense to me at the time but it was like a weird foreshadowing that maybe this may not be the way such a positive change and I don't know you know I couldn't say that at the time so you were saying I'm so sorry to interrupt you were saying that when you saw the broken glass you read it as a symbol as a sign of something yes. uh, not good that is coming in your life. Yes, I just felt like it was, because all of a sudden I'm just eight years old and I get this like, I I think I fell asleep for like 10, 15 minutes when the flight was was taking off and I get this like very weird dream, okay? And I remember it at point to point and I just they see um, um, glassware uh, falling in pieces and um Which is and then idea. i woke up and then i told it to my mother and yeah it did it was just you know my mother just told me it's not that you know just just be positive so yeah um very weird stuff but yes um and i was eight years old and then we landed in karachi pakistan and we took off life there um so it was charge of, there were struggles out there significant what kind struggles, of struggles when we, uh, is it is it money is it um, uh, opportunities for work? Uh, obviously, you were uh, too young at the time to um, understand the full aspect of the struggles that uh, your family was facing. Um, but, uh, for example, when you started going to school over there, you obviously didn't speak the language uh, in the very beginning. Uh, so how was that? Um, was it difficult for you to start speaking the language uh, and to understand the uh, um, local perspective of things? Well, from what I can say, and now that my mind has developed nicely and, um, you know, I, can, I have a full opinion at how the country runs and how stuff happens, um, I, I would say it's a progressive movement over there. You know, you gotta learn, you gotta learn, you gotta learn, you don't have many choices. You gotta deal with the system and um, there are no exceptions so we were told that we couldn't get admitted in schools until we knew both languages two complete new languages which was um the provincial language of the state and the national language of the country so um yeah we were we were we had to go through that that was a kind of a difficult uh, situation because it's not easy to just learn the language so Uh, what is the official language in pakistan pakistan is urdu Urdu. It's it's Urdu. It's very similar to Hindi, okay. and yeah, um, that's the language. But yeah, they want you to read, write, and understand, and that's kind of a situation. That was kind of a hard situation for us, but we overcame it. It took about five 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 ish months. 
So not only for you, but for your siblings as well. Yeah, absolutely. There are no exceptions, so yeah. Okay, and um, so obviously you went through all this and eventually you uh, um, started getting better at the language and the writing. Yeah, luckily I was I was pretty smart about that stuff, and I I, I would still consider myself I'm pretty smart. But yeah, um, I learned it pretty fast, and you know we were just excited to get into the school environment, um, which we did not anticipate. Um, the school so system is absolutely different over there. The uh, the lifestyle is absolutely different. When I say different, let me just explain this to you that um, it's not like United States. It's not like Canada. It's not like UK. It's a very different system. And it's I can clearly state that um, it's a first world towards a third world country. And when I say that, it comes the basic miseries that everybody needs to, everybody's a part of who lives over there are, um, are electric outage. Okay, there's no electricity for eight, 10 hours a day, maybe mm-hmm. 12, maybe 14, wow. but it depends on the areas. Um, but yeah, everybody is a victim of it. Um, no electricity. The hygiene is at a very low low. Um, there's garbage all over the place and, you know, there's, there's, it's kind of a, a mess um, in certain areas and especially the populated areas. It's not... Um, it's not ugly, it's just, you know, people don't mu- have much time to put in for hygiene. And um, that just tops off miseries because if you have a open house and the sun is always coming because it is a humid country, you know, you may not have air conditioning, you may not have heating in the, in the winters. And um, that stuff is hard it to adds, keep up with. It adds on. It adds on and it keeps adding on. And the the gutter system is not great either. And you know we lived in a very um, small house, and that's so a lot of the things that we take for granted over here in the United States are actually not present at all in in Pakistan. And it just you realize um, how good it is to have them once you once you lose them. And no, absolutely. And Pakistan is a beautiful country. Don't take me wrong. Okay, it's a, I I've met great people. I've met a ton of great people. Of course, it's yeah. just that you know um, the lifestyle, the stuff that we have over here that even a homeless man over here has over here. And I don't want to. No offense to the homeless man. All respect to him, but it's just you know it's stuff that it's a different world. You know, even if you're so initially when we were moving back to Pakistan, the whole perception was that. How bad could it be? We weren't rich exactly. We weren't exactly living in a 10 bedroom apartment or even a two bedroom apartment to be honest with you. But we were um, living a basic life and our perception was that it's not gonna be that hard. But when we hopped into, when we landed to the, in the country, we saw like stuff where there's no gas and you know gas shortage and electricity shortage and poverty, um, in, general, poverty yeah. in general is at a high high extreme um, when i say that um the biggest confusion for me in the net in the three four years of me landing over there which means that i was eight nine ten eleven a four and twelve even and it was such a big confusion for me to understand the 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 level of distribution of wealth okay um there was a top i would say two percent or one percent and there was a low of eighty percent and you know it's crazy and there are so many people who don't even have sandals in their feet and there are so many people who don't take anything in in as a factor because they have money, you know, law can't do anything. There's no law for the rich people. There's no, um, there's no guidelines for co- or code of conduct for anybody who has money. And that top one percent has so much money that they own houses here, London, everywhere, yeah. as opposed to those people who that eighty percent or I don't know. I'm just roughly throwing you stats, but I'll be honest with you, it's a huge difference. Um, I, it was so hard for me to just visualize people walking on the streets. There is with, no middle class. Uh, it's uh, 
severely poor and severely rich. And yes, and it, well, there may be, you know, what, what I mean by that is, you know, um, there's a lot of the country, the major, the majority of the country is in the poor class and they have to be a victim of all this stuff. They have to deal with their hygiene. They have to go to pneumonia and whatever it is, you know, these diseases because they just can't afford um, living in a better area. And um, for the rich, um, they can have generators. They can buy their own generators. They can generate their own electricity. And, you know, they can they can have these people um, clean their houses and you know, it's it's a. It, I don't get it. I still don't get it. It's a huge because the government doesn't really help anybody. Okay, and um, when I say that, basically, I mean that you know, how, over here we got like programs, charities, and um, NGOs, and all those stuff that actually helps out um, the people who need it. But over there, there's not a lot of options. There's there's only so much you can do. Um, my 15 year old brother was working over there in a call center overnight um, to provide for the family of eight and it, I know how it was he I think he got hundred dollars a month if I were to sum it up or maybe even less for eight people and there's a huge difference between the um, the dollar to uh, repeat ratio so yeah um, but our our family was was going through a tough. How time. much would you say a dollar equals in rupees? Is it sixty rupees? Uh, with the time we we landed, it was sixty. Right now, I believe it's hundred and two. So, yeah, inflation has something to do with that. But, yeah. but yeah, all these factors we had to face, and it was it was one way or the other. You had to face them or you don't. So, so as you were growing up, um, as you were uh, getting older, you started getting headaches. And in the beginning, your parents didn't think much of it, uh, but your headaches were uh, appearing more and more often. Do uh, you want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, um, I was doing pretty well at the time. I was 11, I would say, um, and I was well set. I was doing very good in the education system, the metric system, and um, I was you know, proving the point of me being a solid man, you know, where people would actually step up and say, he is the man of the house after my father. And, you know, it, it felt good. It felt great. But it was a lot of uplift. It was a lot of uplifting. You know, they just want to put, put you high up there. And I was there and I was, as long as I was maintaining that status, I had absolutely no issue in them treating me as a hierarchy because it felt good. You know, everybody likes it that time. Um, but what happened is that suddenly when I was 11 and a half, I can say, I started getting headaches. Um, the headaches were intense headaches. They would last about five minutes, maybe 10. And then it was progressively came to an hour and two hours. But um, I would just not be functional at all in that time. And um, it was pretty bad. So. so eventually your parents took you to the doctor and they uh, run blood tests, but they came out uh, clear. Um, they couldn't find anything. Yeah, um, my parents actually took me to um, a very reliable uh, pediatrician and he did all sorts of tests. He examined me for quite some time and there was, everything was, was great. You know, the heartbeat was great. The blood counts were absolutely amazing. And, you know, everything was, was satisfactory. So the assumption was that he's probably just going through stress. You. So, yep, that, that those, I'm probably just having stress. And, with school. With and... school and the transition of the countries and the, the whole like there was there was a lot that was going on so yeah that there was a good possibility that I had that but unfortunately I didn't so um, so you continue having the headaches um, after the doctor cleared you um, of anything being wrong with you you continued having headaches uh, till one day uh, you woke up and you couldn't open your eyes. Yes, um, so my headaches were progressive and um, um, slightly, I would say the third month of 2008, I um, started seeing double as well and um, 
it's about a week of me seeing double and blurry vision and all of a sudden uh, one day I just couldn't open my eyes and it was very weird it was a very scary, scary feeling I did have a sense of that something was wrong but I was in denial because I didn't want to lose the status I was holding of being a good functional progressive man who's gonna you know carry the name of and the legacy of my father or whatever you want to call it but yeah it was more um i did i wanted to ignore it so i kept going at my pace you know i would just take that whatever whenever i had those headaches i would just stop and then start over right right where i left off but it was getting really bad in the last like um couple weeks of feb of 2008 and um progressively uh, I think it was 7th of March and I couldn't even open my eye. So that that led to um, me going to additional doctors. So what did they find? Well, um, I, I was told um, when I opened my eye finally, I sat right next to my mother and she saw my eyes and she kind of freaked out because my eyes were crossed. Okay, and um, the cross eye was not a it showed some extreme um, diag- it gave a negative uh, vibe I can say that and to my mother and my mother just like said that we need to take an action right now what's happening you know and then she told my father to take me to a doctor an eye doctor because maybe this is all the headaches and all the vision and maybe it's all leading to the eye itself so well we ended up going to the doctor and um, uh, I, I guess I was vomiting as well at that time. So uh, five di- five times in the morning, the first week of March before the eye incident even happened. But five times without eating anything, I would vomit and then everything would be on track uh, until the headaches came in. But yeah, that week was a tough week. And then we ended up to the eye doctor. The eye doctor was a brilliant doctor and he tried his very best to come up with some type of conclusion. But unfortunately, he couldn't because um, he couldn't see behind the eyes. He, He came he tried all sorts of things, but he couldn't see past the optical nerve because the optical nerve seemed a little, um, sw- swollen pretty badly. So, yeah, that was it. Um, so, eventually, I, uh, um, I'm, you find out that eye is not really the issue or the core uh, symptom of your problem. No, it wasn't. It wasn't at all, actually. Um, so, we ended up... He observed me for about four hours and saw my my me being going through those headaches and even vomiting and he he knew that this was something more serious so what he did is he wrote my he gave a prescription for um an mri okay a detailed mri with and without contrast of brain so that he he could he could tell what was it really happening. Um, he knew it was not the eye because you know um, the swollen nerves gave him a uh, an indication of something very serious. So he t- he gave my dad his personal number and he told ordered my doc my dad that he had to call him as soon as he got the result. So what did the result show? The result, um, it was it was like a foreign language to us. Honestly, we were so curious to know about it, and it just seemed like uh, it was very hard for us to understand, to be honest with you. But so, um, we, my sister actually took that day off from work, and she um, dictated the entire result to the doctor, to the eye doctor, right? and um, that showed that that eye doctor ordered my sister to take me to an immediate um, brain surgeon, a neurosurgeon, because this was not something to be taken lightly and we should not delay this anymore. So, um, you found out eventually that it was a tumor. Yes, we found out that it was a, it was a pretty big tumor on the brainstem of the brain and um, it had to be extracted as soon as possible um, as the, the uh, hydrocephalus level, the brain pressure was going to a very uh, high extent, which could be very dangerous in terms of um, brain hemorrhage 
or even uh, brain damage. So, yeah, I was told that, that I had a tumor, and yeah, that was a pretty tough day for me. And where exactly was your tumor? I mean, you just said on the brain stem. Where exactly is this? So it's basically um, in between. You can say the neck and your your head. Um, that's where your brain is actually located. It's not in the front. It's it's really in the uh, um, buried uh, towards the back. But yeah, it, that's where the tumor was located, um, where pretty much all the nerves are pretty much connecting to the entire body. Also, it, yep. It's the main highway of the yep. nerves to enter and exit uh, your brain. Yep. Uh, which also means that if they operate, uh, the, the, the surgery, even, even if it's successful of extracting the tumor, can uh, leave you crippled for life. Yeah, um, well, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a very hard place to where the tumor was. And there was a good likelihood. I didn't even know about the diagnosis until the very last night. So May seventh, I got diagnosed. Last um, night before May 8th. the surgery. Yeah, last night before the surgery, I actually found out that okay, I was gonna undergo through such a surgery. My parents just told me that it was something very simple and it's gonna be la 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 and it's gonna be beautiful again. But then uh, until the last night, I actually went to the restroom and it was all disclosed to me. I I overheard a conversation between my sister and my aunt that they were speaking about um, out in the hallway and while I was in the restroom I, I just heard it clearly what was happening maybe my senses were a little too active at that time but I'm glad because then I knew what I was going into and it burst my tears like never before and it was a very tough time because I just found out that my mom had signed some medical documents saying that the doctor will not be responsible whatsoever of the outcome. And there was a good chance that I could die. I could go through paralysis for life and I could lose my memory. And something terrible, something horrific could happen. And there was a good chance that that would happen because um, my sister was discussing this with my aunt where the risks were pretty high because of the location. And I was not expecting a two-hour surgery that my I was initially told. I was actually expecting an 11 to 12-hour surgery straight. So, yeah, it was, it was a, the craziest night of my life. I went through a lot of deep thoughts. I went through an immense amount of pain mentally because I was 12 and I was told that there was a good likelihood that I'm gonna die. And all my standing, all my status, my um, gender role, everything was left behind because I was losing everything. I was, I was very scared of what was gonna happen. And I, I was a self-reliant person and I knew that there was a lot of dependency that was gonna come with it. So yeah, all, the, all, the entire night I could not sleep for, I can say 15 minutes. And I, had, it, I was 12 years old, but still it was a very, I, I just couldn't allow myself to sleep because I was thinking that maybe this is the last time I could see ever again. Yeah. So I wanted to make the most out of it and I was just looking here and there. My father was lying right next to me and my brother was lying on the couch over there in the prior and in, in the room and you know it was just a conversation i was having with i could say god or you can say myself i was just trying to con um convince myself that i'm gonna i want to either die at that point in that surgery or i want to either live to the fullest i don't want to be um, I don't want to be a part of any misery and I don't want to lose anything at all, okay? Because um, I knew how the world would treat the weak. I knew how the world would treat the people who were not upbeat. And I saw it because one of my brothers was not upbeat and it was just tough for him to, you know, do anything at all. And um, I, we live in a very competitive world. Um, going to Pakistan even fixed that, embedded that in my mind as well, um, even more, that if you were not something complete, you are, you, you, you're gonna, you should be ready for a very frightening ride of life.
So I, I, it was just a very, you know, big thing for me to overcome. Obviously, it wasn't something simple, but I'm, I'm glad that I, I did whatever I did to make myself feel the way I was. So when you wake up after the surgery, what is your first thought? What is your first memory after the surgery? I remember that uh, in the book you were saying it was very cold and you were in shivers uh, and you had this big pain um, on the back of your skull and you almost felt like they removed your neck. Yeah, uh, that's it was how you kind felt of. About it. You didn't know what exactly is happening and what exactly they did, but you felt like you don't have a neck. But yeah, well, it was kind of funny because I was kind of pissed at my doctor because I thought that he actually extracted my neck instead of my brain. You know, instead of my head, mm-hmm. because it was such a, it was one of those areas. Obviously, I was a kid. I would say if someone says it's a brain surgery, I would think that it's right on the brain. You know, and my perception was that brain was right over here. So, um, yeah, um, I I went into for the surgery and I was taken, and um, I was the last thing I could remember was this um, these anesthesia people feeling bad for me, and they I got that shot and I was gone. Um, I don't. Rem- it was all I was lost my consciousness so I was blank yep and then I woke up and I was in so much pain that words cannot describe what I was what Mm -hmm. I was going through my um, I remember my the same aunt used to work in that hospital and she was uh, pushing that the bed Pushing, pushing my bed after surgery to and trying to get my attention by keep saying you know my name um, Alex 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 and wake up Alex you're done you're done so everything went well and um, it was you wouldn't react it, I I could not even cry if I wanted to I could not even lift a finger okay it was so much pain and you know the thing is that for even crying, you need strength. For even doing anything, you need strength. I was out of it. I, I was just shivering to the height of uh, cell phone vibrating, I would say. Um, but yeah, I was just moving and I was really, really, really cold. As you mentioned in the book, I, I did a good I did a good job in mentioning that. But yeah, it was, it was just um, a lot of pain um, and suffering through that, those days, so. Yeah. Um, so a few months passed and, uh, the outcome of the surgery was, uh, that they have removed the tumor or, or at least most of it. Um, yeah, no, the surgery was very successful. Um, I'm glad that my doctor did a great job. No, you had to go through chemo and, uh, also through, um, radio treatment. Um, as well, was that in Pakistan or, or that was in the United States? So um, the once the tumor was extracted, um, we I I had to face the rough diagnosis of my life. Um, the biopsy reports came out, and it was stated that it was fourth stage. Um, the tumor cells were fourth stage cancer. So, and the likelihood what that means is the likelihood that the tumor will come back likely. Or, or there's a higher probability of it coming back, something like that. So um, we found out, and my mom had the peace of mind that we need to be in the United States because the United States is the best country of medicine, which I agree with. Um, so I it just felt for me it was a good point too. But yeah, everybody, um, I came with my sister um, to the states um, to see what was happening and. Um, when the biopsy report came out, my Pakistani doctor, who did an exceptional job again, um, told me, told my parents, which I overheard again. I don't know what was what was really going on with my ears, man, but I was doing well. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm just being honest with you. Um, I, he told my parents that I had two years left in my life. So I had to walk through the entire whole thinking again of the faith thinking you know all the thoughts and I was 14 I'm gonna be dead congratulations you know I don't know I I, I don't know how to react to that it was so much that you know I I didn't do and I there's not much I would do in the next few years so it was just a kind of a weird 
um, diagnosis. But he told us that, and then in the United States, the doctor over here um, in the Luton General, he told me that um, I was likely to live. I was likely to live pretty strong, and I, there would be no doubt that I would not overcome this diagnosis. I just got to be strong. I just got to go through radiation and chemotherapy. Um, eight cycles of chemotherapy, about two years worth, okay? And um, uh, six weeks of consecutive radiotherapy, a hard um, dosage of it. But it, that should make sure that my tumor existence is gone forever. So is your vision still blurred at this point? So um, that, you know, right now at this point, um, I see double. Okay, and I see double, and I need a surgery for that. But that has nothing to do with the tumor. That has nothing to after do with the, after the that. after the brain surgery. Uh, did your vision uh, restore its original uh, state, or it remained blurred? As soon as the tumor was extracted, my cross eye was fixed. Um, I, I think it was a week. My blur vision went away. So I also know that. Um, Eventually, they installed a tube that needs to drain your um, excessive brain liquid. Um, yes, um, so I, I... The likelihood of me getting a shunt surgery, which was a second brain surgery for me at the, at the time, was a lot. Um, it was it was gonna happen. That was the likelihood. Very but my doctor wanted didn't want to do this immediately because he thought that maybe I get lucky and I don't have to go through that because the tumor extraction immediately fixed the the, the eyes. So there was uh, um, the brain the nerves were still still swollen, the eyes um, but the eyes did get better. So there was he wanted to take a chance. He knew that I needed. A second brain surgery to get the, get rid of the all the abnormal blood flow, um, because yeah, when you have some type which was built up due to the tumor, yeah, preventing the uh, blood to exit the brain. Yeah, whenever you have something um, abnormal in your body, it can be an appendix, it can be just a clot, and it, it its whole entire role of existence is to make uh, your normal body abnormal. So yeah, I had to. So yeah, we went through that and um, we took the risk that we didn't want to do the surgery. Maybe it worked out just like my doctor um, anticipated or hoped for. So um, so yeah, that was it. And then over here, they gave us a lot of hope, you know. And then I did go for my second brain surgery. It was a different type of surgery. It was that was here in the United States. Yes, it was, it was uh, done locally over here and... Um, it was not, they didn't insert anything in my brain, but, or in my head, and they just, basically what they did is they just tried to do, use an alternative, and it was a pretty smart thing to do, just to avoid any type of permanency, yes. permanency in, in like lifestyle, or friction in what I would do, because if or you have a, your brain if, and well, if you have if you have a tube, you're not gonna live the same way you sure. shut, you know. So they they just tried this surgery. So currently in you, you have a tube. Um no, so so till this point, I don't have anything. Okay, okay. um till this um the twelve year old. So as as soon as I well currently today you have a tube. In yes, in yes. So currently, yes, I do. I have actually two. So two tubes. Yep. Um, and but, they are uh, and they serve the purpose of draining the uh, build up liquid in your in your brain well y yes to release the pressure the pressure yep so um yes the, the, right now i do have that but at the time i didn't need it so um at the time i didn't need it as soon as i went back to pakistan i had to go to my third brain surgery which was the shunt insertion so wow. that was my first shunt insertion and then everything flew pretty pretty liquidated from there and it was it wasn't that bad at all so obviously that's a lot of money involved in all these procedures now how were you able to gather the funds to go through all these procedures surgeries doctors analysis uh, i mean uh, how much would you say we're talking here 
we were talking a lot of money, um, especially in rupees. It was it was a lot, a lot of money. Okay, and um, knowing my brother's income, that wasn't gonna kick it in. That was barely paying for what we needed for essential living. Um, so my sister was working for me specifically. She was making all the funds and trying to make up all the payments. But along with that, in a country like Pakistan, you don't, you don't, um, then you're not going to get admitted in the hospital. You will not get a single tip of the treatment unless you do a down payment of the entire down payment anticipated of the entire bill. Pretty much you're saying you'll be left for that. Yes. And I, I can swear to you on this that there are several people who die on daily basis in pa- countries like Pakistan where um, For the you got the money, you're going to be treated. You don't have the money, you can, may God help you. That's, that's just the way it is. As I said, it's like a race and if you don't run, you're going to be like a broken egg. And so I wouldn't you be mentioned- wrong saying that. Yeah, but yeah, um, you mentioned in the book that your family manages to gather money from relatives. Um, yeah, um, so there were there were a bunch of people, great people yeah. who helped out. Um, sure, some were my brother's employers, some were my brother's colleagues, some were my sister's colleagues. You know, everybody did. Uh, you know, it was amazing. Um, when people get together, they can really make a difference, and that that's what happened. Um, my family, my external relatives, um, my father's side. Your um, distant relatives. That, yeah, I could call them distant relatives. They actually pitched in as well. Um, yet their pitching in was... It came with a price. It came with a price. It came with a long-term price, and um, I appreciate you know, but them for being who they are, and I appreciate their their giving, because I can't be I can't go wrong with that. The only thing is that um, they they had it seemed like they had a very big agenda behind it, and I today when I came to the United States, I, I saw that pretty clearly. So they use this act of kindness to promote themselves, um, almost to brag about it. I wouldn't be wrong in saying that. It would be entirely... Um, well, as I mentioned in the book, um, what happened is that my... When I... Um, they thought that they had to say so over you. They they did. Okay, and Over they would, you they, and over your family. They would throw money. Okay, let's just say that, that would, they would throw money to my parents and my parents needed it, so they took it. And th- that was just, okay, well, you know, just just throw the money in the black hole and we'll make a name for ourselves. And in, the, in a country like Pakistan, as I said, if you're left behind, which I was, I was significantly, I lost the stature I had ever, okay, I was never going to be okay. That's their percep- perception, okay? And it was just like, he has brain ca- cancer and that's that's something that he needs to deal with. And he is weak, and he she's. They told my mom that she's lost a son, and basically, it was just. In, it was all leading to the fact that I was never going to be the same guy, or never going to be considered the same equal that I was before. And um, my family, um, they were they were not a positive influence on me. They were. It just seemed like evil heads all over the place. And um, I, I just hated the fact that I had to take, I had to use their money to, for my well-being, but it was just survival for the fittest. You got to do what you got to do sometimes, and that's what my family was doing. And they would listen to all the crap they had to give. They would l- listen to all the assumptions and presumptions that they had for my life and my well-being. And, and accept whatever they had to give. But um, today, as if right now, I do not have any contact with them. I hope and I... With your extended family, you mean? Nothing. I, I got nothing to do with them. They are not worth my time. Yeah. And they are not worth my efforts. I don't even want to see them in my dreams. And this is specifically uh, your uncles from your father's side. Yes. The, the, the people are, you know, um, when I, I came to this country, I have uh, $300 in my pocket. How old were you when you came back? To the I, came back I came back. I came back permanently. 
I came back. So the reason why I came back was because I was tired of this negativity that every Pakistani had for me. Okay, he's done. He, he'll be fine. You know, hopefully, maybe it was just I was tired of that that whole environment. And so this is after the third surgery. This is after the third surgery. This is actually after chemotherapy. Okay, okay which was a very tough time. Both these therapies were very rough on me, but. Um, you yeah, came, you came to the states for the chemotherapy. Then you went back uh, to Pakistan. I came for the states for the radiotherapy, and then I went back to Pakistan, and then I had the chemotherapy. Okay, and okay. that was a two years of my time, a uh, very hard two years because life was just passing by me, and I was stuck in the corner. And you had the bed. tubes installed in Pakistan. It, it was all done over there. Yeah, it was and all then you surgeries. decided to come back over here. Well, the reason why I decided to come back, and it was a very tough challenge and decision I wanted to go with, was because I, w I had so much downtime from different people, including my closest and everybody, that, and that I wanted to prove a point now. It was on my ego now to come over here and prove them that I was still the fluent man I could ever be, and I would still I was I would still uh, I I wanted to prove a point technically. I wanted to prove the point that I'm not useless if I uh, I am a post cancer patient, and I have done uh I came to this country with a uh, um, not so a big brother. And three hundred dollars, and I have multiplied that three hundred dollars by tons. Today, I until last year, I was actually the head of household of four people, and I was successful in calling my mother here as well. So I've I've proved my part very nicely, and you know it's been it's been a wild ride with the relatives ex exclusively because. Um, you know, it, it, my my fourteen year old brother got sent to my uncle, so that he could stay with my uncle. So Alibi one of the party. uncles was here, or maybe a few of them were. All here. of them are here. In the All States. of my uncles are here. Yep. So your brother was pretty much um, not forced, but um, um, out of better luck, he he stayed with one of your uncles. Um, Temporarily till you get on your feet and uh, Well, that was the plan. That okay. was the plan. We were I was supposed to Not worry about him until I was set. Okay, okay. and I was way far from set right now and, and this is your younger brother. This is my younger brother. And you were the second youngest in the family. I was the second youngest in the family and um, The plan was that what was gonna happen is that um so I'm coming, I came over here, okay, and I work my ass off, clearly, and mm -hmm. I keep building uh, while my younger brother gets sent to my uncle's house so that he doesn't have to worry about the bills and he doesn't have to, because my, one of my uncles luckily, surprisingly, very surprisingly, uh, volunteered to take my brother for a couple years. Okay, and what happened is that things didn't go as planned, my older brother got sent back to Pakistan because he just didn't want to deal with the uh, with the tough life that we were dealing with over here. We were living with our um, uh, my mom's family friend and she um, So it was you and your older brother living with a family friend while your younger brother was living with your uncle. Yes. Correct. Okay. Yes. Um, so my older brother just couldn't stick around because my 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 family friend was not approving of her. He was lazy, and as I said, he's not a beat till this day, and he is what it is. But you were living in the basement, yes. not not affecting uh, this family friend's life upstairs. You you were also trying to barely show yourself, just so the family friend doesn't even have to think of you. So you were pretty much left in the basement, uh, keeping away from the daily routine of the family friend. Well, it didn't seem that way, you know, um, it was just... For the family friend, it didn't yes, seem Yes, it way. didn't seem that way, no. Um, there were restrictions um, that we had to follow, and there were certain things that we had to do and to survive, and uh, we were doing Survivor for the Fittest because we knew that these uncles were just not our worth time, okay, and uh, these guys were just floating in the air for nothing. Yeah. Um, while my my mother makes the decision of sending 
the other brother, my older brother, is getting sent back to Pakistan because he is just not meeting the desires of the family friend. And the family friend actually had a friend living with her that was, she was absolutely crazy. I can say that very confidently. And she was the reason why we had to face so many restrictions in her house because she was an equal member mm -hmm. and she would just use us to the finest and then tell us that we were useless. So um, ultimately what happened is that the older brother got sent back, younger brother came over here. I told my mother not to send them because these uncles are not something to rely on, mm -hmm. but I had a negative feeling about it. And then ultimately, um, I would say he promised about two to three years to keep my younger brother. And um, my younger brother got kicked out, I believe in the second Overnight. Month. Overnight, 4 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. I got a call from his elder son that he wanted to take him up. Now, my question was why? I knew my uncle was a big drunk. I knew that he could not control his lust. So if you, if so, 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 so pretty much, uh, if you don't listen to what they have to say and if you don't agree with it, if you say anything um, that doesn't go with uh, his saying or you have a difference of opinion, it's a problem. Well, that's my that's my entire father's side. Yeah. You bow down to them. If you don't, you're you're you're, you're nasty, garbage. You're, 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 garbage, you you're a bad person, and you you will be punished to death. You know, like it's one of those things by their treatment. How old was your brother? Your younger brother? My when brother he got was fifteen. Out? My 15 brother, years old boy. He was a fifteen year old boy. He got boy. kicked out of your. Your, your blood relative's house. My blood relative's house, my uncle, my father's brother, brother. who um, kicked him out. Um, he was drunk and he just was repeatedly was saying stuff about bad stuff about our family. Family history, and, specifically uh, with his, his disagreements with your father that started back in the day. And then all of a sudden he just um, tells my brother, get out. Okay, and he literally picks up his hand and kicks him out of the house. And um, for what my brother tells me, um, I met his second wife. I don't know, first wife, second wife, something like that. Your uncle's second wife. My uncle's, wife. something like that, yeah. Um, and I met her and I asked her what was wrong and what happened. And did he do something or was there, is there some type of reconciliation we can do? I'm going to work out a deal because I don't have my own place right now. And she just said that, you know my husband, he's like that, and your parents should have never sent him. Then my question from her was that, why did you agree with, why did the uncle agree in keeping my brother when he couldn't? But that was just an unanswered question, and that just remained like that. So life got a lot, 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 lot harder after that. And he actually offered to take your brother. Yeah, he offered. He he made the offer. He initiated and he would, the entire thing. Yes, he initiated the entire thing. Maybe he was just taking a revenge, okay, from my father. But um, he called him to this country from Pakistan, seven only oceans to apart, kick him out. To only to kick him out in two months, okay. And um, yeah, so I, I, you know, this is just only one event out of... Of, of, of many of okay. many that you can find in the book yeah it's fascinating it's it's a roller coaster of of um so many things it's not just the struggles uh, and family feuds uh, as you're as it's happening to you you're going through your um survival mode uh, with the brain cancer and so when i read the title a story of a survivor it's not only the cancer there is so much more that you're telling us about it's yeah yeah the relationship part to chapter is pretty interesting young relationships young, young relationships yeah. yeah absolutely yeah. as you're growing up you're going through um uh you're falling in love uh, yeah so. no that happens you know and it was kind of <laughs> with all the stress and the brothers the getting kicked out <laughs> and then the brothers coming back and then the mother coming back 
and then love happens too. But it's, yeah, it's amazing. It's it, amazing. It, 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 the, the, as I said, through my site is not. It's a lot of things. It's a survival thing, and a lot of people can relate to it in, in one way or the other. But yeah, sure. as opposed to the family goals, the family is just right now at a discard high a high level of disgrace to know them even and have them as my family. I know it's it's unbelievable of what they have done to sure. our family and it's just you know so it, there's an extent to everything and, and they have passed every 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 sure. margin line mm -hmm. and they're just unreasonable people and you know what sometimes you just gotta make tough decisions at this time of my life i make my tough decision of getting them out which i should have done in the first place but you know survivor for the fittest we gotta we gotta get the people rolling and we gotta live the way we can um so where do you stand today? What is uh, the situation with your tumor? Or should I say, with your eyes, even today you're wearing shades, you're seeing double. Um, so um, as, as if the eyes goes today, the eyes, um, I'm gonna have an eight surgery very soon, okay? And that should fix the eye issue. Um, so even though your eyes became better, eventually they, uh, went bad again. Yes, and then I had another surgery um, to try to make that work out, but it didn't mm -hmm. work out. So now we just got up. It's a very easy surgery, luckily, and it's going to happen very soon. So hopefully the eyes will get fixed that way. And then um, life is probably going to be on track. I don't know how I'm going to think after this experience, but I may have to write another sequel to through my side. You because, have to. You have because, to. Because, yeah, I, I, I don't know. You know, as I said, I've been like this for the past year. I have dwelt with twice as much as miseries. I never want to, and in my life, I never wanted to be the weak one. But unfortunately, my fate just keeps falling short. And my free will is just impeccable i can say that if it wasn't for me i asked my mother last night who why do you think i'm alive right now and who do you think is responsible for my life and there was only one question and she can say whatever she wants but um she said what i wanted to her to say because she seen and witnessed my struggle solo solely right next to me and she her answer was that it was only me um, you know, this whole book is written for a positive message. I've been through a lot of relationships. I've been through a lot of um, miseries. And I, you know what? I, the only the sole purpose of this book is to actually spread a positive message that no matter how hard life could possibly be, it can't be worth giving up. Because guess what? These relatives need to see the true me. And I'm emerging right now. And I really hope that things will lay out for me and I'm gonna prove them every bit wrong until they exist so Malix it was a pleasure talking with you uh, you're an amazing person you have written an amazing memoir um, and I want to urge everyone to read it um, not only people who are dealing with cancer but people who are dealing with life which we all fall into this category I uh, find your book absolutely extraordinarily interesting and I'm very thankful that I had you today conducting this interview. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I Thank appreciate you. it. You take care. You too.